All right, so today we're going through Acts 24. We're going to get some lessons uh, from Paul this morning that I think uh, will help you uh, reflect on your own Christian life. So you remember now Paul, you know, has gone from Jerusalem, he's gone to Caesarea, and now he is before Felix, the governor there at Caesarea, and his accusers from Jerusalem are coming, the council, uh, the Sanhedrin, are coming also to participate in this court case, and they have brought a lawyer along with them uh, to, to tell us. <clears throat> so let's go through this. Firstly, we see Paul's accusers. Paul's accusers in the first part of this chapter. Acts 24, and after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. Now what we see here in verse 1 of chapter 24 is we see the hatred that the Sanhedrin and the council in Jerusalem and these accusers of Paul have towards Paul, that they are willing to travel. I mean, there's already political, you know, uh, friction between the Jews and the Romans. They wanted to judge this of their own matter and to take Paul into their own hands and obviously wanted to deal with him violently. But now they've had to travel all the way to Caesarea under the governance of the Romans, uh, of Felix here. But it shows you when people are driven by hatred, they're driven by this desire to get revenge on somebody, that they will, do, they will go above and beyond, they will do irrational things. So like here, you can see here the hatred that they have towards Paul, that they're willing to go to such extent for one man and to try and kill him. But it also shows how feared one person can be to the ruling class at the time in Jerusalem, that they're willing to go to such extent to <coughs> oppress one man. Verse 2, And when he was called forth, Tertullus, or Tertullus, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, began to accuse him, saying, So now we see Tertullus, who's like the, the lawyer that gets up and makes his case, uh, give his case to Felix. And what I want you to note here is just see the difference. I'll point out a few things. The difference between Tertullus and when Paul gives his defence. And I don't know if when you read this chapter and you read the speech of Tertullus that the just disgusting flattery that comes across and to tell us in the way he speaks, it, it, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that even the King James Bible in English, <laughs> this disgusting flattery kind of comes across and you read it with a kind of snooty attitude. Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that it be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. So in these couple of verses, we see here the flattery of Tertullus to Felix. You know, really buttering him up, talking. I mean, do you really think that Tertullus and the Jews thought this of Felix? No, there was, a, there was political you know, distrust and friction between the Jews and the Romans back in those days. But he's willing here to his face, sort of butter him up and just, you know, and you can see this is how they operate. It's kind of like a, a, a flattery that comes across to try and get their way. Now, this is something we have to be aware, be wary of, right? Now, it's not wrong to compliment people, but laying it on really thick like uh, Tertullus is doing here. And the Bible talks about being wary of fair speeches. Right? Because you don't want somebody with fair speeches to sort of pull the wool over your eyes and deceive you into thinking something false. And we even see here now, like I'm following somebody in the United States, right, with the presidential elections. There's a, there's a gentleman by the name of Vivek Ramaswamy. And I think he's actually a good candidate. He's got some really good policies, and I think it's, it's really great. But there's, a, there's people that distrust what he's saying. Why? Because he's just a bit too slick. He's, just a bit, he's a bit too fast with his words. They're saying that he talks like chat GPT, like you ask him a question, he just knows the answer straight away. I mean, that's a good quality in somebody, but 
it also makes people wary. And see, we should be wary of that too. When people are a bit too slick, they're a bit too charismatic, that you don't want that charisma, that slickness, that's, that, 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 uh, also that flattery to just let them pull the wool over your eyes to then make you believe something, make you do something that's not right, not correct. And we're warned about this in the Bible. Romans 16, verse 70, look at this. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which, which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. <coughs> <coughs> For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and look at this, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I like we talk about music is a very powerful thing. Music has a message. You know, there are ways people talk. The way you communicate is also a skill. And it's a skill that can be mastered and can be used for good or bad. And you know, everyone now has their phones and has social media and they can listen to all sorts of content. And the content that is the most engaging rises to the top. But just because content is engaging and the, pre and the presentation is good, you still need to be discerning about whether or not what you're learning is actually true. And don't go, well, I just like listening to the person because they're entertaining or they make things very clear, but what they're saying is not actually biblical. Right? So that's something we have to be aware of. And this is what we would expect of Felix as a judge, right? not to just have the wool pulled over his eyes, but Tertullus, who's just having this fair speech and this flattery, to then, uh, for him to accuse Paul of things that are not actually true. 2 Peter 2, here's some other verses that talk about people with you know, great speeches. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, talking about these false prophets, to whom the myths mist of darkness is reserved forever, right? So they are going to be condemned in hell one day. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, look at this, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. And isn't that the truth? The truth is sometimes people like to hear like this sort of entertaining, engaging thing, but it's not because what they're saying is true. It just tickles the flesh, right? It's like with hard preaching. Right? I sometimes think, you know, people like hard preaching when it's talked about somebody else. But when it's referring to them and it applies to them, they don't really like hard preaching. So the question is, do they really like hard preaching or do they just like seeing somebody else get told off? Because if you like hard preaching, when it applies to you, you'll like it as well. Right? Because you'll, do you really like hard preaching? Right? So here too, we see here, these great swelling words of vanity. They lure through the lust of the flesh. So you need to be careful that you're not being just allured to the lust of the flesh, but actually to the truth. Through much wantonness, those that were escaped, clean escaped from them who live in error. Jude 15, so this is a parallel passage to, to the Peter passage. To execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. And look, and all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. Look, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Right, so hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's wrong to be able to be engaged, to be able to be educational. I'm just saying, be wary of being so taken captive by that that you no longer judge what is coming out of the person's mouth. Right? Because that happens. It doesn't just happen with influences in the world. It happens also with preachers. I mean, how many times do people go along, they follow a preacher, they love the preacher, then they just start absorbing everything. They stop discerning what is right and wrong, even coming from the preacher, to the point where they go, when the preacher goes off the cliff, they go off with them. So don't be like that. Right? And be careful. Obviously, these verses are talking about false prophets as well, which will do that. But you don't want to be carried away just with false teaching either by fair words and great speeches, great swelling words. Proverbs 7. So not only do we have to be wary of spiritual uncleanness, there's even a warning in the Bible of physical uncleanness where, you know, when it comes to fornication, there's these fair speeches which talk people into doing wrong. And Proverbs 7 is a warning here to young men of the whorish and adulterous woman. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. 
with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. So just like physically somebody can be ruined by fornicating with the wrong person, man or woman, spiritually also people can become ruined when they start getting carried away you know i'm assuming here people just get carried away with a little bit thing false or here by some good preacher but even those of us who are bible believing and they you know believe on the lord jesus christ can get caught up in either a friend or either an online influence or something where you just start believing all this wrong stuff because you're carried away by the charisma of the person not knowing that your spiritual life is now suffering just like here, physical life is suffering, getting caught up in adultery. Now let's continue. Verse 5. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. It's like you can't help but, you know, read this thing. It's, it's, it's so like, this, this is how you read it when you read this to tell us. You, know, you can imagine sitting in this court case and just thinking like, this guy's just trying to be so slight. And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world you see how he's over-exaggerating, he's falsely accusing him, he's slandering him, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So this is like what happens today, where they mischaracterize things. So this is what you know, lawyers will do, right? When they, they're trying to think, they will characterize it in a certain way. You can see this is what Tertullus is doing here. And this is what we should not do. So we see in the Bible good examples, bad examples. This is a bad example. When you, know, when you represent somebody, we should represent them accurately. We should say the truth. We should not try and mischaracterize them um, so that we become slanderers and railers like Tertullus, even if he's doing it in a sort of uh, pleasant way, quote-unquote. It's kind of uh, you know, stabbing you gently. Who also had gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. So not only do we see misrepresentation, we see mischaracterization, we see slander, and then we just see like outright like falsehood, because that's not what Paul did. He didn't do any of these things. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. So you see how he's trying to paint this picture, like, hey, we were just to be peaceful, we're just trying to judge him according to our law. This, this mover of sedition, this uh, lead, ring leader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and then with great violence, you know, your governor, your captain, chief captain, took us out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thou mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. So there's a couple of things here that we can apply to ourselves. You know, sometimes we will put, be put in a situation but we are mischaracterized, we are slandered, we are misrepresented, and how should we react? So Paul here, you know, we, I'm surely, would be thinking of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Look at this, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. I mean, is this not ha happening to Paul right now? And I think this is part of the reason we see insight into Paul, because God could have just said, you know, Paul went to Caesarea, he had a trial and he stayed in prison, but he gives us this insight so we can have this example to see how Paul dealt with false accusation and having to defend himself and things like that. So we have examples in the Bible, you know, like Solomon, how to deal with the lust for you know, power and money and women and, and, what, and, and the, the, the evils that it, and it brings and the vanity of it. We have Job, an example of suffering, an example of patience. But now we have Paul, which is somebody who is living for God, doing things for the sake of Jesus Christ and how he deals with this, this persecution and this tribulation. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Jesus gives us two thoughts there. One is our response to persecution for our faith should not be one of discouragement, 
but one of encouragement that we are taking a stand for the Lord and that great rewards await us in heaven. But also the second part here is, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, you're not alone in that persecution. There are others that have gone before you and others experiencing the same thing. So you never have to feel like you are traveling alone. And even if you do feel that way, Jesus is always with you. Now what Tertullus is doing here in Acts 24 the Bible's very clear, like these are things that God hates. Proverbs 6, 16, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. Think about how many things are being done by the council here of this list. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Look, the whole idea they're trying to get Paul back to Jerusalem is because they want to kill him, right? They're pretending like they want to judge him back at Jerusalem. So, you know, in, in one way, even though uh, Felix and the Romans are being unjust, in one way, it's actually protecting Paul because if he was not there, you know, maybe he would be taken back or, you know, the, the Jews would try and kill him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. I mean, didn't they have to do that? Figure out what their plan was, get the orator, get their story straight, and then go and accuse Paul falsely. Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, he that soweth discord among brethren. I mean, how many boxes do the Jews check off there in Acts 24? So, the last thought I want to give on Tertullus's speech is, like we see, the flattery, the misrepresentation, mischaracterization, the slander, is that Yes, there's evil people doing this in the Bible. But we should see that that is a bad thing to do and not emulate it. Not justify ourselves when we feel wronged, that then we use slander, railing, misrepresentation, mischaracterization, and malice to, to fight back. Right? Ephesians 4.29 let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is the good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So you think, oh yeah, that's what evil people do. Well, no, that's, that's also what saved people do. When they are scorned, when they are in conflict, and they just want to get revenge. They're in the flesh. And I'm saying, don't be like Tertullus. Be like Paul, as we see him respond here in Acts 24. The Bible says here, let all bitterness, you can see these contentions, wrath and anger and clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Malice is like an intent to harm somebody. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's go on. Acts 24, 9. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So not only did the orator raise these false accusations, but the Jews here are also guilty because they condoned it. They said they rose to the, and adopted it for their own views and said, yes, what he's saying is correct. <coughs> the Bible <coughs> and the Bible condemns this, that we should not just join in the crowd willingly or ignorantly just to condemn somebody. The Bible speaks against it. Exodus 23, look at this. Thou shalt not raise a fa false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. So, even God's word was very clear to them that they should not be like this, and they're going completely against God's word in, in the law, laws of Moses. Now let's go on to the second part of the chapter, where we see Paul's defense, right? Paul's defense. And we see the difference in how Paul reacts versus what is being accused of him. <laughs> Acts 24. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years 
a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. So even Paul's opening is very different to Tertullus. He doesn't just lay on the flattery with flattering words very thick. He acknowledges with respect Felix's position and he is courteous of the opportunity to be able to defend himself. See, so there's nothing wrong with being respectful and being courteous. But we don't want to just have these false, flattering words like we see with Tertullus. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. So now he's giving the context of what happens and denying the false accusations. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. So Paul here in the next couple of verses, he flat out denies the accusations. So it's not wrong here to defend yourself because some Christians have the mindset where they just go, oh, well, you know, just, just leave it for God and just let the chips fall where they may. And they sort of feel like they're not being spiritual by speaking up for themselves. And I don't think that's correct. You know, I think God does help you fight your battles, but you, as a believer, there's nothing wrong with you standing up for yourself. Like Paul here. Paul's not just going to go, oh, I'm just not going to be represented. I'll just let them decide. I'll just leave it to God. No, he stands up and he says, no, what they're saying is false and I have not done these things. Right? And they cannot prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Acts 24 and now we see Paul with boldness, with clarity, you know, with courtesy. He just sets the record straight. He's not mischaracterizing anything. He's just saying the facts as they are. And that's really a good principle to follow in our life, is that if we just tell the honest truth and say it in a courteous way, in a respectful way, that's the best way to operate. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Is he saying anything false here? No, he's saying this is exactly what's happening. They think it's heresy, but that is what I believe. <clears throat> and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. So is he mischaracterizing them? No, he's saying, I believe something which they also allow, which is the resurrection of the dead. That there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void <coughs> of offense toward God and toward men. This is another, this is a great passage I could have used in my sermon last week where, you know, we try and live a life pleasing to God. It can give us a pure conscience and we can live with a clear conscience. This is what Paul did, that he's saying, my conscience is clear, that I didn't do anything wrong. They can't prove what they said that I'm doing. Yes, I believe something they call heresy, but at the same time, their beliefs allow for the resurrection of the dead, and this is what I'm believing about Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, I am operated with a pure conscience, like he said in Acts 23. And lastly, here we see verse 17 onwards. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. So he explains why he came to Jerusalem. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So what we see here now from Paul is a challenge. So like we said, we talk about, and I, and I sort of coin, I don't coin the phrase, but I tend to think of this as, you know, Ned Flanders Christianity. Because when I was younger, I watched a lot of Simpsons. And we all know Ned Flanders in The Simpsons, if you watched it back then, he was like this pushover, right? Remember Homer, take advantage of him. Everyone take advantage of him. He was always too shy to take... And that's what people in the world think a Christian should be. Just this pushover. Not stand up for yourself. Not somebody... No, but the righteous, the Bible says, are bold as a lion. See? We're wise as servants, harmless as doves. There are different characteristics. We're not just old lambs, just dumb, bringing sheep to the slaughter. You know, there are different aspects of the Christian, of being a righteous Christian. There are times, obviously, for, for different things. But there is a time to be righteous, and, and uh, the righteous are as bold as a lion. So, 
Not only here does Paul stand up for himself, he denies the accusations, but he also hits back. Right? He throws challenges back. And that's why as, as believers, we also should not be shy to hit back and to challenge back with respect and courtesy and, and, and you know, without malice and all these things. But he does. He says, hey, they, if, if you had these people accusing, why aren't they here? Bring them here. It's because you can't prove it. Or else let these same here say, if they've found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice. This is the one thing they don't like. That I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Right? So he makes the challenge. Like that, is the, that is the real reason. You can't say anything else against me. You can't prove it. The one thing, and that's the one thing he's willing to admit. By the way, that they call heresy. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are in the prophets. He's saying that is the one thing they have against me, that I cried standing among them, <coughs> touching the resurrection of the dead. I am called in question by you this morning. Now, Paul here, his testimony, reminds me a lot of Daniel. Remember Daniel? They tried to find fault against him. And the one thing... They couldn't find any fault against him, but what did they try and find? We've got to find fault against him and his God. Daniel 6, 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none, <coughs> none occasion, <coughs> nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of of his God. Hmm. Now what I want you to think about here is, and this is one thing I think this chapter of Acts 24 is really emphasizing, is the importance of having a strong and blameless testimony as a believer, especially in the face of scrutiny. Because here Paul is being scrutinized, but he can stand there with boldness having that blameless testimony. He'd be able to say no. And, and to defend it. Same with Daniel. Why can they hold nothing against him? Because he had that blameless testimony. Now, <clears throat> yes, in these situations, they're defending in court, Daniel's ruling. But just think about in regard to salvation. In regards to, no, sorry, not in regards to salvation, in regards to soul winning. Because the same happens where you make a case and they're judging what you're saying. You don't, your, your testimony is so important because you don't want to be distracted from the issue. I mean, look at here. Evil people will distract from the real issue by trying to bring up things that they can blame about Paul, things that they can blame about Daniel. That's not really their, their agenda, but that's what they'll use. So think about when somebody doesn't want to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think they will use our faults? But if we can have a strong Christian testimony, there's less for them to say. Now they have to deal with what we're saying rather than the person. Like here, they have to deal with what Paul's saying. They have to deal with what Daniel believes rather than who they are. Now, does that mean we believe in work salvation? No, but I'm saying your testimony will, will force people to consider the words that you're saying and not distract from the truth. But your testimony can have the opposite effect if it's not a good testimony. It can distract from the truth. And people may not be so open to hearing God's word because of how we live our Christian life. So consider that when you think about how serious you are about the things of God, that you are removing the power of the gospel to them because it's distracting them from the truth to the life. Whereas... You know, if, if we have a strong testimony, we can be like that. We can be like Paul. So, you know, am I saying I'm like that? No. But this is something we need to, to think about. We need to take seriously because we want to be effective, don't we? Don't you want to be effective at sharing the gospel with other people? I mean, if, if you don't care, well, I guess it doesn't matter, right? Because you don't care either way. But I think you're here this morning because you do care. I mean, surely you care to some extent. So if you care about how your words fall on the ears of others, hey, our, our testimony is important. How we live our Christian life is important. Not only for soul wedding, but also in the face of persecution, in the face of scrutiny. And the Bible talks about this. That, you know, we, we don't want to get in trouble for our, 
for legitimate faults. But if we stand on trial or we're persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, for doing what is right, that is something to be rewarded for. That is something to, be to take glory in. First Peter 4, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of God and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You know, so you don't want people to say about you, you know, you're lazy or whatever, and all these bad things. You know, you want them to say things like, ah, oh, look at Mr. Holy coming in. You know, that's what you want people. You know, if you're going to be reproached, you know, be reproached for being somebody that's above the parapet. You know, it's to somebody that has high standards, somebody that's holy, somebody that does not accept sin. Let them make fun of you for that. Hey, that's where God is glorified because you're being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ then. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. You know, I always chuckle when, uh, you know, people know I pastor a church, you know, and then they, they're, they're talking and then they swear and then they'll be like, oh, sorry, Victor, sorry, I'm swearing. You know, like, you know, like, like, like they're doing it to please me. But my point is, they notice, hey, there's somebody in there that doesn't swear, that doesn't appreciate it. Hey, that's, you know, they, they can make fun of me. Oh, you're a person that doesn't swear. But hey, good, right? At least I'm trying to lift the standard for Jesus Christ. But, you know, people do that, try and excuse themselves and things like that. But it's, I always chuckle every time that happens. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. First Peter 2, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So you see there how argument is not enough always to win people over and to make them quiet. The Bible says here, how we live, our well-doing, our good works, also helps to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Titus 2, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So notice there, he's not just saying to the young men, sound speech, that thou have no evil thing to say of you. There's also the showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. So you see how the, the, the way you live and the way you behave yourself, like David said, behaved himself wisely, also has an impact in the things you say. So it's your words and your actions if you want to have the most impact on other people. So this is why your testimony as a Christian is, is very important. And we see here in this chapter the difference between Tertullus and Paul. Now let's go on to the last chapter and just finish the last part of the chapter and finish this off, where we see Paul detained. Paul detained. Acts 24, when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. So, you know, Felix here is obviously an ungodly governor, that even though he knows what Paul is talking about, and why we learn a bit later, because he's married to a Jew. Right? His wife is a Jew, so he's, he's, he's aware of the beliefs of the Old Testament and we even see later when Paul's talking to him that he trembles because he knows in his conscience that Paul is right. And even though Paul is right, he still delays judgment and puts, keeps Paul in prison. Two years. You know? Now, he gives him liberty. So this is where Paul's writing a lot of his letters you know, and things like that. He's bound. But in one sense, I wonder it's because you know, it's not ideal. God is using these unjust governors, but at the same time protecting Paul giving him liberty to continue his ministry, you know, basically protected by the Roman army from the Jews. So, which is an interesting like, thing, like we talked about in Acts 23, like he's going to, to Caesarea with, you know, how many, 850 people, never. 
you know, this, this convoy being divinely protected but using the unjust judgment of Felix. So Felix delays this judgment, even though he knows Paul is innocent. He defers the judgment of Paul, defers this decision. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. <clears throat> so this explains why we see with Paul, he's, he's able to have people come and go, he's able to minister to them, but he's saying he's bound because he's, like we know, he's under like house arrest, right? where he's not allowed to go anywhere, but he's protected, but he's technically bound, awaiting trial. You know, this lengthy court process that is being drawn out just to please the Jews and for them to you know, not have to release this person that they know will anger the Jews. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, so we see here an insight into why he writ he actually knows these things because he married a Jew. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. So what is he saying here? Go thy way for this time. He's just saying, go away for a certain period of time. Right? When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So we see here a couple of things. <coughs> we see here Felix deferred the decision to judge Paul. And unfortunately here as well, Felix defers the decision to believe on Jesus Christ. Which is a sad thing, that people, they know what is true, they can't fault it, yet they defer the decision to believe on Jesus Christ. And that's a very sad thing. You know, it's like when we go soul winning, we beseech people, hey, just, if you believe it, just accept Jesus Christ now, because it's a sad thing. If they understand it, they know that they're a sinner, they know the Bible's true, and yet they will not make that decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, like Felix does here and Festus does later. You know, he says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What sad words that people get so close to believing the gospel, but for the wrong reasons, they delay it when they shouldn't. So we see here he delays it. He, uh, you know, defers the decision for his own salvation. Verse 26. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him, whereof he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. So here we see the unrighteousness, the, the perverted judgment of Felix, that not only did he defer judgment for political reasons, he also was trying to hanker up a bribe from the Apostle Paul. And he says here, this is why he kept inviting Paul because he thought maybe he'll wear Paul down where Paul will just offer him some money to let him go. I mean, what an unrighteous judge. And the Bible talks against this. Obviously, bribery, but the Bible has verses about judges not accepting bribes. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not. For I will not justify the wicked. And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of, of the righteous. All right, so this is not talking about just receiving any gift. This is talking about a gift that perverts judgment. And this is why judges should not accept bribes. Police officers, those in authority, should not accept bribes. This is why even in corporate businesses, you know, corporate businesses, where you're in sales, you're dealing contracts, you need to be very wary of accepting gifts because it can be seen as, well, now you're conflicted in your judgment about decisions that you're going to make. So you have to be wary of that. These things have to be disclosed and whatnot. So here, Deuteronomy 16, 18, we see again, judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert the words of judgment. So we see here Felix desired a monetary gain over executing righteous judgment. 
Acts 24, but after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. This is two years later. Paul is still bound. His court case is still not heard. He's still not released. Up until the next person comes into office, Felix, uh, Festus, and they leave Paul bound. Why? For the right reasons? No, because of political reasons, right? To keep the Jews happy rather than doing what was right. So, what do we see here with Felix? Don't, he is an unjust judge, right? He's making decisions for the wrong reasons and condemning the innocent, justifying the wicked. Now, how can we apply this to our lives? We ought not be an unjust judge, right? So we see here, don't be an unjust judge in your life with your authority. You say, well, I'm not a judge, I'm not a leader, but we all make decisions in our life. You know, whether it's in our workplace, whether it's in our family, whatever situation we're in, we are making decisions. Now, are you a just judge in that decision? So don't just apply it to condemning somebody else. Do you get what I'm saying? Like when you're a judge presiding over a decision between other people. What about the decisions you make in your life? You are judging on what decision to make there. What is the right decision? What is the wrong decision? And do you judge righteously? Do you do the right thing? When you make decisions, do you do it according to truth and not just what is expedient? Do you make wrong decisions because of money, right? Like Felix did here. He desired money rather than what was doing or what was judging what was right. And the other thing we see here in Acts 24 we also see here, remember we compared Tertullus to Paul, and we talked about Paul's testimony being able to stand boldly. But I think what we see here as well is we see Paul's testimony carried not only publicly, but privately. Because some people, they have a, they have a, a look publicly, but when they go home to their wife, or they go home to their husband, or they're in the, you know, amongst their friends, or they are, you know, in the privacy of their own home, what is their testimony like? You know, they are on the outwardly appear righteous, but then their business dealings are all dodgy, right? Extortion and all this sort of stuff, you know, bribery, you know, all that sort of stuff. Is that what it's like with Paul? No. Paul, bold, did what's right in public, but it's not like in private, he's like, yeah, actually, I'll just bribe my way out of it. No. In private, even when, you know, he's t sort of being tempted as like, you know, he, who knows what the conversations like were with Felix. Maybe Felix was hinting. He's like, you know what, I, I could move this court case forward, but, you know, maybe if, uh, you know, you help me out a bit, you know, you can imagine that maybe he's hinting to Paul, but Paul didn't take the bait. He didn't succumb to that. I don't know if that's called extortion, you know, when you're saying, I'm going to keep you bound unless you pay me some money. But he didn't succumb to it. He trusted God, did the right thing, just as bold. You know, he's not worried about offending Felix. He's just as bold in saying, you know, what you're doing, and this is, this is the truth, where the point where Felix trembled. That is Paul's private testimony. Didn't succumb to the extortion even after two years. Didn't use his circumstances as an excuse not to serve God. I mean, couldn't Paul, you know, in private, nobody really knows what he's doing in house arrest, just say, oh, you know, it's just too hard. I'm in house arrest. What can I do? Throw his hands up. No. He still serves God even in unideal circumstances. And he preached the gospel boldly to those in authority. I mean, he even risked maybe getting himself into more trouble. But no. He preached the gospel to them and shared the truth with them too. So one last point of reflection for you. What is your testimony like when no one is looking? You know, we shouldn't be Christians where we're one way on a Sunday and a different way every other day. You know, don't live your life like that. You know, yes, okay, maybe, you know, you come here, there's different standards and things like that. You have to watch your tongue, you have to watch what you dress. But it's so much better if you just live, you're just that person all the time. 
You know, so if you have those convictions, then live them all the time. Have be the same person. The person you are here on it's a lot it's a lot easier, like we talked about living a life pure of conscience, with a pure conscience. It is much easier to live a life where you are the same person on Sunday as you are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And that's the sort of Christians we should be. That's the sort of Christian Paul wants. And that's what we should strive for. That the person we are to the public is the same person we are to people in private. Ephesians 6 talks to this. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So you, your primary motivation for doing things in life should not be to please others, to please men. You want to do it because you please God. And if your reason for doing it is to please God, then there's no reason why it shouldn't be do, done every day because you're doing it for God. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So, we don't want to do things just to be seen of men. Not with our physical works, like we see here in Ephesians 6, not even with our spiritual works, as is alluded to in Matthew 6. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. When thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. And that thine arms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. All right, so just to recap in conclusion, maybe you took some good self-reflection lessons from Acts 24. One, beware of fair speeches leading you astray. Okay, make sure you know God's word. Don't be just captivated by somebody's preaching or somebody's talks or you start believing things that are false. Two, don't have malice in your conversation. So like we saw the difference between Tertullus and Paul, Hey, we should be like Paul, not be like Tertullus. Even if somebody's done you wrong, hey, that doesn't justify corrupt communication, you know, evil speaking and malice. You know, let's always be courteous, respectful, and uh, be straight talking. Number three, be careful to jump on the bandwagon of false accusation, whether it's in a private setting, personal setting, or even on social media, right? We need to be careful that we don't just jump on this bandwagon Follow, them, follow the multitude to do evil. Number four, have a godly Christian testimony. Like Paul and Daniel. It will add more gravitas, more weight to your words. And ultimately, that's what we want as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We want people to believe the gospel. So our testimony is also important if we want people to take our words seriously. And number five, let's make sure our good testimony is not just one publicly, but one privately as well. Let's be the Christian we ought to be, not just on Sundays, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all the way through the week. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for teaching us this morning from your word. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will go forth into the hearts of the people and that they will, uh, you know, in their conscience, be convicted of their own conscience um, and Lord, help us, help us to learn from these verses, help us to know the importance of a good testimony uh, as Paul did, and Lord, help us to be encouraged by Paul's example as we strive 
to follow in his footsteps as he followed you. So we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.